So in 2020, George Barna, who is a pollster, who is often polling about um, beliefs and opinions in the religious world, surveyed the U.S. population. So we're just talking about America here about the origin of a number of popular phrases that many Christians use and believe as part of their doctrine. They show up in other religions too. And so this month, we're gonna take a look at several of those statements and discover what their origins really are and explore how they resonate in unity. If you saw the title of this month's series, that says the Bible doesn't say that, you can already guess that they're not scripturally in the Bible. But when George Barna did this poll about this particular phrase, God helps those who help themselves. How many of you heard that? Many of you probably even said it um, to people to, when they were lamenting about how things weren't happening. You may have like, come on, you've got to be a part of that. Well, in fact, 75% agreed that this comes from the Bible, and 81% agreed that it is a basic Christian doctrine. It is a base, it's part of the embedded Christian theology. When in fact, this phrase has been around for centuries. It's not something that's new. It might have been spoken a little differently, but the idea of it has been in our human awareness for a long time. In fact, the origins of it date back to ancient Greece. At least that's the best documented place we can find it. It may have existed before that in oral tradition. And it first shows up in the early 400s BC, at least in written form. The sentiment appears in several ancient Greek tragedies Sophocles, I'm probably not going to say that right, so any of my Greek scholars, you can tell me afterwards how much I butchered that. Um, in 409, wrote this, Nor good e'er comes from leisure purposelessness, and heaven ne'er helps the man or the men who will not act. In, Euf in Euphrates, in this Hippopolis ve veiled, which is around 428 piece, BC, it mentions, Try first thyself, and after, call in God. For the worker, God, no, for to the worker, God himself lends aid. So it's the same idea. And similarly, we find God helps, God himself helps those who dare, who are willing to step out there. The phrase that we know today, the way that we speak it to one another today, shows up first in 1698. It was, interestingly enough, from an English political theorist. His name was Algaron Sidney, and later Ben Franklin pulled this up and put it in the um, Poor Richard's Almanac, Almanac, and it really became embedded in human culture. God helps those who helps themselves. And while most do feel like that is part of the Christian teaching, if you actually Google it out there, you'll discover that a large swath of Christian theologians absolutely disagree with this statement and deny it as being part of the Christian documents or doctrines. In fact, they would say a more accurate statement is this, God helps those who cannot help themselves. As sinners, there's nothing that we can do to earn our way to God. This idea, and, and does show up in, in many Christian scriptures, that we can't, it's not our works that can earn our way to our salvation. It is only through faith and grace that we can get there. We, of ourselves, can have no effect on our life. It is only through the grace of God that we can begin to step into our wholeness. In fact, I found this theologian, Aaron Armstrong, says it, says it 
this way. Oh, if I could get my mouth to go today. All right, he says, God does not help those who can help themselves because as sinners, we cannot help ourselves. We cannot save ourselves from our bondage to sin, nor from the wrath of God. So he does. Our own power fails us when we rely upon it rather than God. And to believe that God helps those who help themselves is not only foolish, but it's proud. Pride motivates the belief that we can do everything by our own gusto and go-to attitude. That we can pick ourselves up by our spiritual and moral bootstraps. But God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. It mirrors in some ways the, the scripture that Jesus often quoted, it is not I, but the Father within me that does the works. I think this statement has become so embedded in our psychology, perhaps through our perception, our theology, through our cultural values, especially in America, because it is a reflection of the values in which we came and formed this country around, not necessarily because it was ever taught in Christian churches. If we are looking at this through our spiritual lens, remember all the different spiritual lenses we could understand our culture from, this is a very orange ideal. In fact, America was born in large part out of this orange value system. Very early America was all about self-initiative. It was about do better, try harder, pull yourself up by those bootstraps. It was about self-agency and self-determination, which are values that many of us still hold very dear to our hearts. You can do all things through God that strengthens you, would be the scripture we'd pull out to say, see, this is part of what is our inheritance as believers and as followers of this? So how does unity see it? And that's a pretty broad question because how unity through my lens sees it and unity through your lens sees it might be very different. So this is going to be my opinion about how this shows up based on unity principles. If God helps those who pray and move their feet which is one of the ways that we see things. And others believe that God helps those who are helpless, who are ego surrendered, surrendered, what's really true. And here's what I ultimately came up with. God helps. God helps. God helps those who are actively participating in their own spiritual journey, and God helps those who are unable at any given moment. And sometimes we're both of those. Sometimes we are, we, we are both of those statements. And God helps. Our third unity principle, this truth statement as we understand it to be, states that we're co-creators with God in life. We co-create through our thoughts, through our feelings, through our beliefs, and ultimately through our actions. And co-creators would indicate that we're active participants in this process. We are actively participating with God in our experience of life, that we have that same God DNA that Jesus did, and therefore we can do those same things. We have that same potential. And if we want to experience that same level of love, of peace, of purpose, of passion, that the Christ demonstrated, we have to actively participate in it. It doesn't just happen. And yet, we are free to use these powers however we choose to. We can use them with our focused attention to create whatever we want in the outer world, health, success, wealth, those things that are important to our human journey. And we can use that power to live out our soul's mission. And I think each of us come to this earth at this time 
in our unique expression to add something to the world. And the only way we do that oftentimes is by letting the ego go and being willing to be guided. Letting what we think we know is best and being willing to let spirit take the lead. To let that Christ within be what directs us as to how that gets expressed out into the world. Sometimes, at least in my experience, living into our soul's mission happens through determination. It happens through fearless action. And sometimes it's coming when we feel so utterly helpless that we're willing to surrender it all, to say, I don't know. Help me. And then, guess what? God helps. In fact, as Ralph Waldo Emerson reminds us that once we make a decision, once we are clear and our energy is focused and our attention is in the direction of where we want to go, whether it's inward or outward transfer, transformation that we're seeking, the universe conspires to make it happen. We've been set up so that all that we need is there. We just have to get into agreement with it, into alignment with it, and have our whole selves be focused in that direction. Developing this relationship with God, with spirit, calls us to lean into a new level of trust. Sometimes spirit guides us and we go, no, thank you. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not willing to do that. And the real growth that we experience comes when we're willing to go, all right. I'm not sure where this is going, but I'm willing. I'm willing to step out. I'm willing to at least try. Sometimes following the guidance of spirit is the most direct access that we have to really being able to know and live out our soul's mission. To be able to experience, and this is what I've discovered, it is only when we're following the guidance of spirit that we get to experience that unshakable sense of peace, that unchangeable feeling of love. The outer world is in constant motion, maybe good one day and not so good the next, and that is the nature of the outer world. But when we are living a spirit-led life, we find that peace that passes all understanding. So today, for our meditation time, we're going to just take four or five minutes and invite, if you're willing, spirit, that energy of God, that love of God, that peace of God, to infill us. It's already there, but we want to experience it infilling us and in that space, be able to listen to what's next for us. Perhaps we've got a specific question we'd love guidance on. Perhaps we're just open to see what happens. And I, I regret, Bob, I didn't tell you, this is going to be musical. Yeah, so I don't, I don't need any tinkling today. <laughs> Maybe later. So as the music begins, we're just going to let the music guide us through this process, and then we're going to enjoy a minute or so of silence, and then we'll bring, back, bring, bring us back to this place. So just get comfortable, breathe, feel that energy of breath moving through you, and invite the Spirit of God into this moment. At some point in the room.
Just take a few moments in the quietness of your being to listen. And as you're ready, you can slowly begin to bring your attention back to this time and space, aware of your body and the chair supporting you. And you can open your eyes. So as I wrap up this exploration of God helps those who help themselves. I wanted to leave you with a scripture that I believe spoke to how Jesus understood this question of how God helps. And it comes from Matthew 6.31, and I'm going to paraphrase it, so <clears throat> it's sort of in, in modern updated language it says, so do not consume yourself with questions. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Outsiders make themselves frantic over these questions. They don't realize that your heavenly Father knows exactly what you need. And it is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. So seek first that kingdom of God, which is love, and all other things that you need will be added. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Living spirit-led is a large enough task for today. Ultimately, however you come down on that side of the question of how God helps, know that God helps. Whether it's through you, as you, or by you. You don't have to go seeking anywhere outside for the answers and for the help that you need. You've got it in you. All right, so today is the first Sunday of August. It's hard for me to believe that we're already in August, although I'm ready for like October. So if we could just kind of speed it up even quicker or for northern cooler temperatures to find their way down to us in the south. But this is each first Sunday we invite you, remind you, and encourage you to share what you can over and above your normal Sunday giving or your normal monthly giving to help us reduce our line of credit debt. We increased that debt in May and in June to re replace two air conditioners and also to cover the cost up front of our annual surplus insurance. And all of the monies that come in earmarked are used to directly pay down the line of credit. They go directly to the loan. And to help reduce this debt as quickly as we can. And we're also pulling out of the general fund $1,000, which we were typically paying towards our old monthly reasonable health insurance, and along with $500 that we had committed minimally to continue to reduce our line of credit. So we have taken all those money, and I'm really um, grateful and delighted to announce that over the past two months, we've been able to pay down $11,870. <clears throat> and that is thanks to gifts both larger and smaller. It takes all of it. And we are just grateful that we continue to see and to know that all of this happens with ease and with grace. So any amount, any amount, I mean, whether it's $5 or 
as much as your current situation will allow that you can give to that. Again, we'll go directly. We just ask that you earmark that, whatever it is. If it's cash, please put it in an envelope with um, you know, debt repayment or anything to let us know that that's what it's for. Checks, make a note of that. If you're giving online towards that, please make a note of that in the comments box so that we can make sure that we funnel that money directly to this debt reduction. Another way, because you know sometimes people can't always give additionally give additional e in the finances, is an opportunity to volunteer of your time and your talents. So the month of August, we're also calling this our volunteer um, appreciation and invitation to others to step into this. So all month long, we're going to have some shine up sheets at the back of the sanctuary. Some. As you'll hear over the coming month, our opportunities to serve on a Sunday. Others are flexible and may happen during the week. Others are really calls to those who are um, ready to step into some leadership for this church. And it's a great way to share those gifts that you're already comfortable with. And it's also a wonderful, safe opportunity to stretch if those are areas that you might have a little bit of discomfort in. For example, like today we're, uh, we're highlighting ushers, greeters, and ambassadors. Now for those who are naturally extroverted and love to connect with people, this might be a perfect opportunity for you to really be able to extend your love and your friendliness. We're known as a very friendly church and helpfulness to people who are newer to us. And it's also a great opportunity if that's an area that is a little bit uncomfortable for you to be able to stretch and grow into and to expand that way in which you can be God in expression. We're grateful for and deeply appreciative. Know that your leadership and your staff who has to manage getting those bills paid every single month are so grateful for all of the ways in which you share with our community. Let's join together and let's bless what we offer today or the energy of what we are offering throughout the month. Blessed in our hands, blessed in our hearts. Together, divine love through me blesses and multiple, multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, Father, Mother God. Yes, sure, going to invite go ahead and you to stand come up. up together. Let's join hands and we'll do our peace song. So as we go into this day, into this week, knowing that God helps, we go, knowing our prayer for protection together. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. Join us for some lunch in Fellowship Hall. <laughs> <laughs>